good morning and welcome to LLT 121 Classical Mythology. When we last left off in our last meeting, we were discussing anthropomorphism versus animism as two rival conceptions, if you will, of deity. It sounds very profound to say rival concepts of deity, but simply state it. Animism is deification, the making into gods and goddesses, of forces of nature and other inanimate objects. The sun, the moon, the earth, and whatnot. As I tried to suggest in our last meeting, the animistic conception of deity is usually, not always, but usually the conception that a civilization starts out with. The example I offered you last time was of the clock, that mysterious round disc on your left with the things that move round and round and round. It's obviously exerting a force on your life. Just what it is, though, we don't understand. We just miss it by saying it's a goddess, the goddess clock. As human civilizations develop, as human civilizations become more at ease with their surroundings, as they become more adept at building houses, communications, agriculture, and the like, they begin to almost insensibly see their own place in the world moving up just a little bit. They're more confident of who they are and what they're doing here. And they begin to wish to exert a little bit of control, if you will, on the inanimate objects and the forces of nature which rule their lives. It would be nice if we could make the sun come out and leave at will. It would be nice, for my yard at least, if somebody could make it rain at least once this month before it's over. If you believe in an animistic conception of gods and goddesses, it doesn't matter. The sun is a big ball of fire in the sky. There's no point in praying to it because it is a big ball of fire in the sky. If, however, we start attributing anthropomorphic characteristics to the big ball of fire in the sky, to the brown stuff that we walk on below, we begin to be able to exert a little control over it. Moreover, in this entire passage of today's lecture would make an excellent beginning for an essay examination. I don't know how much more blatant I can be. I've already mentioned that cultures tend to develop anthropomorphic conceptions of deity. One, because it affords them a little bit of control over the deities. If I attribute human thought processes, human wishes and desires to the rain, to the sun, to the earth, to that clock up on the wall, it gives me an angle to try to persuade it to do what I want. It also, this anthropomorphic conception also tends to help us explain and account for goings on in the universe that we wouldn't know otherwise. <clears throat> if you have ever been caught out in a really great thunderstorm while you're out on the road or just out in the middle of nowhere with no shelter over your head. It is to this day not all that hard to believe that the gods and goddesses are angry. Somebody upstairs is really mad at you and letting you have it. And if it's an animistic thunder and lightning deity, it's just happening. You can't make it stop. But if there is a thunder god or a thunder goddess, 
Oh, the thunder god, the thunder goddess is angry. If I pray the right thing or make the right sacrifice or do the right ritual, maybe it will stop. The anthropomorphic conception of deity, a couple things more I can say about it. Number one, doesn't automatically replace an animistic conception of deity. By this I mean, it's not as if on January 7th, 1401 BC, all ancient Greeks will automatically switch over from an animistic conception of gods and goddesses to an anthropomorphic conception of gods and goddesses. You just don't trade one in for the other. The transition from animism to anthropomorphic conception of deity in Greek mythology is gradual. We don't have any written record of it, so to speak. We don't have any ancient Greeks who tell us Yes, I was raised animistic, praying to trees and shrubs, and now that I've come to Zeus, I really... It doesn't work that way. We're forced to go into the myths, go into the stories themselves, take them apart, put them back together, and look for clues of how this process might have developed. And I'll tell you right now, I think we can. And I promise you, that we will. And as my present to you for being with me this morning, I'll even make it an essay question on the examination. Pay attention to what I'm saying, bring in interesting questions, write it down really good, take good notes, and you're home free for, geez, 30% of your midterm exam. I can't be much more blatant than that. The transition from animism to anthropomorphic beliefs is gradual. Another thing I need to point out is, even if we, let's say we are all ancient Greeks, we have all gotten to the anthropomorphic stage in thinking of our gods and goddesses. We all believe that the completely anthropomorphic god Zeus is the ruler of the universe. This doesn't mean that we fire, that we cut loose, that we let go of all of our other animistic gods and goddesses. We don't say that, well, now that we have Zeus, and Zeus is going to be a frequent character in this class, so I figure that I might draw him right now. He started out as a um, thunder and lightning god, but for whatever reason, um, he became regarded as a chief of the gods. Again, if you've ever been caught out in a really good thunderstorm, you might understand why Zeus got to be the supreme god. He's always got a beard, he's very good looking, and he usually has a very slightly receding hairline. As we're going to find out, he is anthropomorphic to a fault. But just because we now worship the supreme god Zeus and think of him as an anthropomorphic god who is the chief of all the deities, that does not mean that we have fired the sky god Uranus. How do we put them together? How do we make these two conceptions of supreme deity work side by side? I'm not going to tell you right now. But what I will tell you, what I will ask you is, when I start to explain this, or try to explain it, please put aside your 20th century scruples. It's going to be a very strange explanation. But keep in mind, one more time, that the transition from animism to anthropomorphism is gradual, and it doesn't mean firing the previous administration of gods and goddesses, so to speak. Another point I'd like to make about animism, as opposed to anthropomorphism, is that in some respects, anthropomorphism, 
conceiving of gods and goddesses as basically human is not necessarily an advance. Let me tell you why. Some of these anthropomorphic gods and goddesses become human to a fault. They become almost characters in a long-running soap opera that we call classical mythology. Anthropomorphic gods and goddesses look like everyday men and women, except for they're bigger, stronger, smarter than we are, more beautiful than we are, and they are immortal. They have human character traits which are more strongly developed than average human character traits. Even their faults are greater than human faults. When you get a god or a goddess angry at you, they can be just as vengeful as any human being, and even worse, because we're talking about a god or a goddess. Let me pause for a question. Let me ask if you have any questions about the difference between anthropomorphic conception of gods and goddesses and animistic conception of god and goddesses. I promise you this is going to be on the test. Okay, your name is? Phil. Phil. Animism is strictly, um, uh, I'm trying to think how to say it, not animals would necessarily be like planets. Correct. Like the question is, does animism apply to planets and animals and such like? Right. That is correct, that um, anything that your culture, Phil, finds particularly worthy of note, perhaps you are not all that keen on trees, but you think planets are neat. Yeah, you can, you can think of the planets of gods and goddesses. One of the things we're going to find out about ancient Greek mythology, thank you for the question, <laughs> is that um, they have small armies of tree gods and goddesses, mostly goddesses, and um, small armies of river and water gods and goddesses. Obviously, at a very early stage in their cultural development, the ancient Greeks were just obsessed with water and trees. Good question. Well answered, too. Other questions? No other questions. My lecture is so brilliant that there are no possible questions then I'll talk more. <laughs> the ancient peoples in general, not just ancient Greeks, but ancient Aztecs, ancient Babylonians, ancient Norse, try to explain their universe in terms they can understand, in terms they think that they have a grasp on. They're not awfully different from what we are today. For example, we, skeptical children of the 20th century, try to explain the behavior of matter by describing it as itty-bitty little unbreakable particles, sometimes bonding with each other and sometimes splitting apart from each other. Does anybody know what these itty-bitty little particles are called? Come on. Thank you. Atoms, right. And each atom has its, each element has its own atom. Yeah, really wonderful. The ancient Greeks came up with that idea, by the way. Fourth century BC. That's nothing new. But have we perfected? Has modern science perfected this conception of matter? Or do we have more work to do on this subject? Thank you, Farallon. Much more work. We have, what, quarks? And sub, you know, I'm not going to get into this. I'm not horribly well versed in this. But the atomic system is just a model for how we think matter behaves. Keeping this in mind, or the Big Bang Theory of the creation of the universe. 
Now, Ray and I were there at the creation of the universe, but we're not telling anybody what it was really like. We're going to make you Generation Xers guess. But the Big Bang Theory is, again, an analogy, a model of how some scientists believe that the universe could have been created. Let's not fault the ancient Greeks and the other ancient civilizations for using models to try to describe the forces in their lives. It does become kind of silly to say that all of the forces of nature in the universe are gods and goddesses who control them. But the ancient Greeks are doing the best they can. They lived in cities who were ruled by, which were ruled by kings and queens. Doesn't it make sense that the universe is ruled by a king? They live in families which, is, which are ruled by a dad because they are a patriarchal society. Doesn't it make sense when you consider this that the universe is ruled by a king and not by a queen? And wait until you hear about this. The ancient Greeks theory of the creation of the universe. Imagine yourselves at the beginning of time. Okay, are we all there at the beginning of time? It's about, oh, 3500 B.C., a number I just made up. We don't know an awful lot about the universe around us. We are all completely animistic. That ball of fire up in the sky, the sun, is a god. What would be a good name for this god? at the dawn of time. Anybody want to guess? I vote for the sun. And that big, advan that big expanse of blue stuff over our head, we call it a sky, right? <coughs> right? Your name is? Yeah. It's, that's right, isn't it? Okay, it's a god. What will we call it, Carrie? You, you are already learning to think like an ancient person at the dawn of time. How about this expanse of brown stuff beneath our feet that we walk on and sometimes gives us good things to eat? You're still crystal, right? Um, what would we call this goddess? Dirt. Or if we wanted to be more respectful, we would call her Earth. I'm just having some fun. You get the basic principle. These are all animistic deities. But how did they get here? Growing up, as most, if not all of us did, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we are familiar with the concept of a supreme being who brings the universe and everything in the universe into existence by speaking its name, or otherwise willing it to be there. And God said, let there be water, and there was water, so on, so forth. That's a very tidy and clean way of creating the universe. No seedy little details, nothing that really strains, I don't think, your imagination too much. Obviously, all these wonderful things about us, the forces of nature and inanimate objects, had to get here somehow. It doesn't boggle the mind too much for most of us that somebody put them there and that this somebody must have been a lot more powerful than us. But this is the traditional Judeo-Christian way of looking at the creation of the universe. But back at the dawn of time, which is where we are still, we're not really that familiar with creating things just by willing them into existence. However, we do know one way of creating something. Would anybody like to guess what that is? Your name is? Scott. Scott? Okay, but remember, I very thoughtfully put us so far back at the beginning of time that we don't know how to build anything. We're still living in caves and trees and stuff. 
sex. That's right, sex. The universe came into existence, according to the ancient Greeks, through sex. The universe was not created in the ancient Greek's mind. It was born. <laughs> okay. A couple more buzzwords I'd like to give you as long as we're at it. If you are one of those people, oops, who believes that the universe was created, okay, created with a purpose, created by a god or a goddess or a deity who knew what he or she was doing and had a specific purpose, that is cosmology. Notice our old friend, the suffix L-O-G-Y. It means that there is a rational purpose, there is rational thought behind the creation of the cosmos. What the ancient Greeks had, by contrast, is a theogony, which is a term for birth of the gods. The ancient Greeks believed that the gods and goddesses who made up the physical universe were born and not created. I'll pause with that thought for a second, take a slug of coffee, and ask you if you have some questions up to this point. Ray. Okay, the base... Pseudo means God, right? Yeah. We get a number of very, very interesting words from the base G-O-N. We get generation, we get gonad, we get genesis and the like. It means creation, but more precisely to the ancient Greeks, it means birth. It means birth. Thank you, Ray. Your name is? Jeremy. Okay. So how did they go about explaining the first God? Oh, I knew somebody was going to bust me with that one. How did they figure out what was the first substance? What did everything come from? Even Aristotle, who was another example of a very intelligent ancient Greek, couldn't come up with that one. The uncaused cause, the prime mover. I'm not going to expound on this too much today. It's a good question, by the way, thank, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. But um, I'm not going to expound on that too much today because it belongs more to Unit 2. But um, it's always a sticky question in mythology. The Greeks explained it by saying chaos. The universe was created, born from chaos. Now, for those of you who have visited me in my office, and there are some of you here, you know that chaos is a good term to describe the mess that I keep in my office. Chaos is a good name for the first day of classes. Chaos is a good name for your wedding day. But to the ancient Greeks, chaos just means a giant void, Jeremy, a cosmic emptiness a cosmic womb, okay, from which I was hoping somebody would ask me this question. I very thoughtfully put it up on the board because I thought I had one person in this room who would be intelligent enough to ask me that question, and I'm glad you did. But chaos is the cosmic womb, the cosmic emptiness from which the first generation of deities comes. And I'm quite sure that, Jeremy, after you've thought about this one for a couple of minutes, you'll have more questions, like who spouted chaos and what is chaos? But I'm not going to answer them. You just sit on them and ask me them on Monday, okay? Because it's not a train of thought I care to pursue right this second. Other questions that I could perhaps answer or make up an answer for? Okay, what I want to do right now 
is go back and talk about the anthropomorphic deities again. I've suggested that in many respects the anthropomorphic deities who look and behave like gods, like, like men and women, only more so, have their uses. One can relate to these anthropomorphic gods more easily. And if you use that phrase on an exam, relate to, please be more specific. I'm talking about humans can relate to anthropomorphic gods in the sense that they can understand the anthropomorphic gods and goddesses thought processes or think they can. They can persuade, cajole, bribe, hornswoggle anthropomorphic gods and goddesses into doing things that they can't obviously do with an animistic deity. But these animistic gods and goddesses, I'm sorry, anthropomorphic gods and goddesses have their shortcomings. In short, they become too human. Too human. To the ancient Greeks, pretty much through all of their civilization, the god Zeus, thunder god, wife of Hera, was the chief of the gods and goddesses who lived on Mount Olympus. Since he was the chief god and king of the gods, the ancient Greeks as associated him with justice and goodness and fair dealing and what is right. Oddly enough, the ancient Greeks also associated with him with being the father of about five million gods and other goddesses. This does not say much about Zeus's approach to a monogamous marriage. But we're not going to talk about Zeus just yet because Zeus belongs next week. What I want to talk to you about is the various ancient Greek sun gods. And again, I'm offering you this example so that you can trace the, de the development of ancient Greek religious thought from animism to anthropomorphism. Let's start out with, let's erase sex. You don't need to be thinking about that now anyway. We have a big ball of fire in the sky. We have already noticed at the beginning of time that it always moves from east to west. We notice these things. Sometimes it comes out and it's nice and warm. Sometimes it comes out and it's cold. Sometimes it come, doesn't come out at all. So on, so forth. Since we are at a very primitive stage of our religious development, I propose that we call this big ball of fire the thingy that goes through the sky. How's that for a name? The thingy that goes through the sky. We're not even advanced enough to have a word for sun yet. So let's call it that thingy that goes through the sky, or in ancient Greek, Hyperion. Hyperion. Hyperion, hyper means over and above in ancient Greek. If you are hyperactive, well, you know what that means. So does my mom. And ion just means going, a thing that goes up on high. That was the original ancient Greek name for the sun. As such, this thing that goes through the sky, this hyperion, the thingy that goes through the sky, has no personality. It's just a big ball of fire. 
However, the sun is important. It warms us. It co helps crops to grow. Okay, gives us our good-looking suntans. It's a force we'd like to understand more about. It's a force that we would like to be able to control, if we will. Okay, if you happen to be getting married outside, you would like the sun god to show up at your wedding as opposed to the thunder god, if you catch my drift. But if these are just animistic gods and goddesses, they do whatever they do, and you've got no control over them whatsoever. Later on, the ancient Greeks came up with a word for sun, all its own, Helios. The word survives to this day. If you have a tree in your yard that is heliotropic, it means that that tree will turn towards the sun, even if it has to bend itself at a 90 degree angle to get there. That can be quite ugly. But Helios is an ancient Greek word for sun, big ball of fire in the sky. And pretty soon, the name Helios becomes associated with an ancient Greek god. Not a big ball of fire, but to the ancient Greeks, Helios was a human being, a man, a god who looked like a man, I should say. Okay, here's a generic ancient Greek guy who drives a chariot containing the sun. Does that make sense? Kind of? Farallon? There was probably, Farallon asks, was, if I'm not misrepresenting your question, was there ever a stage at which Helios might have been an animistic god and then he just kind of evolved in an, into an anthropomorphic god? I would say yes. That would, it's just a guess. We don't have any written record of that, but I would say probably. Oh, that was a good answer. Sometimes he gets to wear a um, really bright-looking, shiny crown, okay? Now that we have made this great mythological advance, what is your name? You are messing with your hair. Heather. Heather. Now that we have made this mythological advance, we have now ascertained that the sun god is actually a guy named Helios who drives around in a chariot. What do we do with Hyperion? Can we fire him? Mona, can we fire him? No, we cannot fire him. We can't say he's, you know, we don't, we, we've abolished this God. We don't believe in him anymore. What most mythological traditions tend to do is what the Greeks do here. They say, oh yes, Helios is Hyperion's son. Okay, I know what you're thinking. How does a big ball of gas get married? God only knows who he got married to. And whatever it is he gets married to gives birth to something that looks completely anthropomorphic. I told you you'd think these explanations are pretty silly. But if you just focus on it for the very real theological advance it makes, a transition from big ball of fire that you can't control to a wild and crazy anthropomorphic god. That is very real progress indeed. Guess, does anybody want to guess who um, Helios's sister is? Your name is? Erica. Erica, do you want to guess who his sister is? No, that's his dad. The moon, okay? The moon goddess, Selene, is Helios's sister. She's a great looking babe with long flowing hair. I'm not drawing well today because I'm barely awake. 
but just like Helios, Selene, the ancient Greek word Selene, I'll write that on the board, means moon. And she is portrayed as a beautiful pale-skinned goddess who drives a chariot containing the moon. They have another sister whose name is Eos, E-O-S, who is the goddess of the dawn. Isn't that nice? The ancient Greek god Hyperion, whose name means the thingy that goes through the sky, has a son <laughs> named Helios, who is the sun god, a daughter named Selene, who is the moon goddess, and a daughter named Eos, E-O-S, who is the goddess of the dawn. And can you tell that they're siblings? Just watch. Just watch. These ancient Greek gods and goddesses become so anthropomorphic that they take on discernible family traits. This particular bunch of um, kids, Helios, Selene, and Eos, are characterized by personal irresponsibility, I would say, and a really well-developed libido. That is to say, they're out there looking for talent. They're out there looking for people to get friendly with. Let's start out with the story. Let me grab my notes to make sure I get it right. Of Selene, the moon goddess. One day, as Selene is making her rounds as the moon goddess, she works 365 days a year. It gets kind of lonely being a moon goddess. You're either sleeping or driving in your chariot. She sees this incredibly studly young guy by the name of Endymion just lying on a mountainside. He's a studly young shepherd sleeping away. Selene takes a liking to this studly young shepherd who's lying there sleeping away. Who could play this shepherd in a movie? Who knows? It was some studly young actor. She looks down. She says, I want to have this studly young shepherd. So she runs to Zeus, king of the ancient Greek gods, and says, can I have this studly young shepherd? And Zeus says, hey, why not? And so Selene, the moon goddess, gets to have Endymion as her boy toy, if you will. Um... And in one version of the story, Selene then asks Endymion, Selene asks Zeus to give Endymion eternal sleep. Yeah, she just wants to look at, you know, stud muffin. She just wants to look at him, right? Forever. Eternal beauty and eternal youth. And Zeus says yes to this too. I have, my question is, this lusty, zesty young goddess sees a lusty, zesty young shepherd sleeping on a mountaintop, and she asks if she can have him. I doubt very seriously whether she's going to ask that he sleep forever and be forever young, but who knows? And he is still supposedly sleeping to this day. Eos, goddess of the dawn, is an equally lusty, zesty young goddess. I might point out here, I will point out here, it's my class, that the great majority of ancient Greek goddesses have no little or no libido whatsoever. That is to say that you read about lusty, zesty gods chasing after mortal, god mortal women all the time. You very seldom read about goddesses chasing after humans, human men. This is because we're dealing with a patriarchal society here. 
that the old double standard of patriarchal societies, a man who messes around, you know, who is very sexually active, is a stud, according to this double standard, where there are many very insulting names for a woman who is sexually active that I will not repeat here. This double standard was alive and kicking back in the ancient Greek days. Goddesses who act on their sexual desires, like Selene and soon Eos, are very rare indeed. So I suggest we enjoy hearing these stories while we can. Eos sees a studly young shepherd by the name of Tithonus. She takes a liking to studly young Tithonus. She asks Zeus if she can have Tithonus. And Zeus says, yeah, go for it. You can have this Tithonus. And Eos and Tithonus live for many years together in happily married bliss. We presume they're married. Maybe they're not. I don't care. But as soon as as Tithonus starts to get old, starts to lose just a little bit of the hair, starts to get a little gray, maybe just a little bit punchy, Eos gets tired of him. Just as happens on every soap opera you've ever heard of, right? Except for it's a goddess deciding to get rid of her male mortal lover. Finally, when he gets so old and decrepit looking that she can't even stand to look at him anymore, she shuts him up in a room and won't let him out. In vain does Tithonus screech out his undying love. The poor guy's immortal, but she forgot to ask for immortal youth for him. So now he's just stuck in that room getting older and older and older until he becomes the first grasshopper. Yep, this is the ancient Greek etiology, the explanation of the grasshopper. Apparently Tithonus just got so old and shriveled that he stopped being a human and started being a grasshopper. I know it's silly, but I'm doing what I can. I have one more story for you. You've been a very good class. Um, and then I will let you go for today. How many of you have ever been 16 years old? Raise your hand. I just wanted to see people raise their hands. You usually get your driver's license when you're 16 years old, right? Or thereabouts. Then your mom and your dad tell you, don't drive too fast. So what do you do? You drive too fast. How many of you in this room got a speeding ticket within one month of getting your driver's license? I waited three weeks. But you see the basic principle, right? If your parents tell you to drive slowly, drive in the correct lane, always use your signals, you have this impulsive urge to do a donut on somebody's lawn at 50 miles an hour. Kids always are that way. They will always be that way. I'm going to offer you a little proof that they always have been that way. Helios, the sun god, was a pretty lonely kind of god. Like his sister Selene, he had to spend long hours driving a chariot through the sky. In Helios's case, he had to spend at least 12 hours a day seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year, driving the chariot of the sun through the sky. It gets lonely. <laughs> Sometimes he'd stop off, meet a friendly stranger for a chance one night encounter, and then be on his way. My God, I think we have just met the prototype of the studly man who can't commit. Because he can't commit. He has to put his job ahead. But one night, well, he's in ancient Ethiopia. He mingles in love with a young sea nymph by the name of Clymene. 
since Helios is a god, they only have a one night stand, but that one night stand, if you will, is enough. This is Helios. This one night stand produces a kid by the name of Phaethon. Actually, it's this, Phaethon. Phaethon of necessity grows up in a single parent family with his mother because his father is the sun god. Of course, we all know that little kids can often be very, very cruel. As young Phaethon is growing up in ancient Ethiopia, the little kids taunt him. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? And he says, my dad is the sun god, Helios. Oh yeah, sure, sure. My dad is um, Trent Reznor or something like that. Um, I'm Abraham Lincoln Jr. Nobody believes him. But the more they taunt him, the more he says, Yeah, I really am, am, am the sun god's son. And finally, he goes to his mother. And he says, Mom, am I really the son of the influential sun god Helios? She says, Yes, you are, honey. He then says, Prove it. Well, she can't prove it, but she says, I'll tell you what to do. Go to the palace of your dad, the sun god Helios, and ask him. Wow. When a mom is confronted with a difficult situation with her kid, what does she say? Go talk to your dad. Okay. Only we're talking about ancient Greek gods from three millennia ago behaving like this and it gets better. Young Phaethon journeys to visit his father Helios the sun god who lives in this great big huge bright palace. He's led into the palace of Helios and Helios is sitting there in his big huge beautiful throne and Phaethon says are you my dad? Yes son I am. Well, Dan, and Phaethon proceeds to lay this unbelievable guilt trip on him. Where were you when I was growing up, Dad? <laughs> and this old, well, I was the sun god. I was busy. <laughs> Routine isn't cutting it. Now, any of you who are parents or any of you who have parents, just nod if this sounds familiar. I've been a bad father. I've let you down. How about if I give you something really expensive? <laughs> Does that ever happen? Let me make it up to you. And then mom or dad whips out a checkbook and buys you something really cool. Here's what um, Helios says. My son, I feel very bad. I will grant you one wish. Whatever wish you want, I swear by the river Styx that I will grant it to you. And whenever you hear an ancient Greek god or goddess swearing by the river Styx, that is a warning sign that a bad career move is coming up. You put that down, bad career move. Because if an ancient Greek god or goddess swears by the river Styx and then violates the oath, they have to spend seven years being dead. And you can't imagine what um, a bummer that is for an ancient Greek goddess or god to be dead for seven years. You're lying there dead and all the other gods and goddesses come by and laugh at you and call you a deadie or something like that. And Helios says, I will swear by the river Styx to grant you this wish. What does Phaethon wish for? He wants the keys to the chariot of the sun. He wants to drive the chariot of the sun. Helios says, anything but that. No, 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 no. Anything but that. And Phaethon says, Dad, you swore by the river Styx. And so now, Phaethon gets to drive the chariot of the sun god with its four powerful horses. In vain, Phaeth um, Helios says, well, don't drive too fast. Don't drive too slow. Don't fly too high. Don't fly too low. The sort of things that your mom and your dad and my mom and my dad, hi mom, hi dad, told me when I was learning to drive, right? 
and your inclination is to try flying too low, then try flying too high, driving too fast, driving too slow, right? That's what you do because you're a kid and you don't know any better. You're programmed. Well, Phaethon flies too high, and he creates the ice caps, the, um, the frozen regions to the north. He flies too low and creates the Sahara Desert. Finally, Zeus realizes that this kid can't drive. 55 or anything else, so he throws a thunderbolt at it, smacks the chariot of the sun god, kills Phaethon. End of story. End of class for today. <laughs>